good morning uh, on behalf of department of english MSCB University, Kyungjar Campus, Odisha. I welcome our viewers uh, to this international webinar titled Mapping Modernism. Uh, we are privileged to have as our speakers for today's webinar uh, two eminent uh, scholars, Dr. Aruni Mahapatra and Dr. Lalit Kumar, uh, who will be sharing their thoughts on modernism and its trajectories, uh, its journeys, so to speak. Uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, we'll, we'll start with the event. I would I once again welcome our viewers. I welcome our esteemed speakers. Uh, let me first very briefly introduce uh, Dr. Aruni Mahapatra, uh, who will be the first speaker uh, for today's occasion. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra is assistant professor of English at University of Alabama, Birmingham. He has a PhD from Emory University, which is on a very important uh, and a fascinating topic, uh, which is, and, and it's broadly on the theme of irreverent reading, uh, where he looks at the way uh, post-colonial writers depict scenes of reading in, in their works of fiction to highlight social uh, inequality. Uh, he has uh, several publications to his credit. He's also taught for a few years now. Most recently, he has uh, published in uh, Cambridge Journal of Postcolonial Inquiry. So, without uh, further delay, I welcome Dr. Mahapatra to make his presentation. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra's presentation will be followed by Dr. Kumar's presentation, and then we shall uh, take up questions and comments. Thank you. All right, um, just making sure, can everyone see the PowerPoint slide titled Mapping Modernism? Yes, it's visible. OK. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Sashwat, for inviting me to talk about uh, a topic that I find very interesting, even though I'm, I'm by no means an expert on, on authority, but I really enjoyed the opportunity to develop my thoughts. And I'm very much looking forward to interacting with uh, students, uh, colleagues, and the general audience on this topic. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and start the presentation. So I want to begin by thinking for a few minutes, uh, a few seconds about the, the thought the the life and work of a writer who must be very familiar to this audience here, uh, Fakir Mohan Sanapati, one of the most iconic and famous and popular Odia writers. This is a scene that uh, struck me very powerfully when I was reading his autobiography, the English translation of it titled Story of My Life. And I often think about this scene when the idea of modernity or, or modernism uh, comes to me. So I just want to begin by reflecting briefly on this scene. So what happens in this scene is, is Senapati describes his experience of trying to bring a printing press to his village, to his community in Katak, and, and the struggles and the failures that he experiences while he was trying to do that. And there's this moment where he's uh, very close to uh, almost death, um, sickness and uh, physical and mental and emotional trauma. Um, everything takes a very serious toll on him. And, and he writes, this is an English translation. Uh, he writes, um, during this time, and, and this is on your screen on the left side, the little screenshot of, of the text towards the second half of the second paragraph, he writes, during this time, I passed out at home a lot of times following long hours at the press, but I kept it from everybody. I put on a brave face when I talked about the press to others. Faced with such misfortunes, I resolved it is either either the press or my life. So this scene, I want us to keep in mind as we reflect on modernity and, and modernism and what it can mean. And because 
this scene reminds me of modernity of of modernity as being embodied by a certain technology which for a certain community of people at a certain time was new and simply by virtue of being new that technology in in this case the the printing press had the promise of potentially producing a good life for those people in in question and we we may call it naive or or we may call it a kind of youth uh, naive exuberance or or excitement but i believe this is a very essential aspect of the concept and the phenomenon of, of modernity which which i will return to but for now i just want us to think about that moment of a desire for a technology that promises newness and i also want us to think about the idea of choice for a moment because it may appear in this scene that that this man is a little bit crazy that that uh, why does he choose to put his life at risk in order to produce in, in order to bring this technology and on the other hand it it may appear like he's making a choice but on the other hand i i do believe that this choice actually reveals a lack of choice because there is a conviction at the at the heart of this effort that through access to books through access to this medium of communication the the people who spoke odia would actually benefit in in the long run so a choice that conceals a lack of choice this is another idea that i will return to now alongside that idea i i want to juxtapose a radically different uh, moment which also brings very powerful thoughts of modernism to mind this is the film titled modern times from the year 1936 that directed by the famous american actor director and writer charles chaplin uh, this is the the criterion collection dvd cover and i have a little gif captured from the movie just to give uh, those in the audience who who may not be familiar just a sense of what happens in the film and very quickly what you see here is the central character the the protagonist whose name is the tramp uh, played by chaplin is trying to work with the pace of a machine but is unable to keep up with the machine and then is driven to a kind of cr craziness which which we don't see here but very soon after the scene th this character is driven to a point of a, a nervous breakdown and uh, what we see here may be seen as a kind of ironic or a kind of savage parody of of what we saw in the earlier instance from the sin of the autobiography here is someone who is right in the heart of a technological universe and that technology is uh, wreaking all kinds of violence on on his body and his mind so this uh, again here as well we see this idea of choice here now the tramp is a character who is forced to work in this factory who is forced to place his physical and mental well-being at the mercy of this machine because he doesn't have a choice now there were people in this society in this country or in this part of the world who did not have to make this difficult decision who could afford to enjoy the benefits of this technological utopia without being driven to a kind of craziness as this tramp is driven to and and we'll see that idea of choice replicated later on so mo mo most of the modernist manifestos were written by people who occupied this technological universe but who were at a safe distance uh, unlike the tramp so who who did not suffer these psychological and and physical kind of assaults of of technology but but who could very uh, luxuriously sort of imagine a very elegant and a, a very poetic relationship with technology now i hope these two images will place us in a suitable position to to understand some of the complexities involved when we try to define this concept of the modern and i've called it an impossible concept because 
the moment we try to define what modernity is or, or what modernism is, there are so many qualifications and, and, and so many special conditions and, and disclaimers that we have to give that it almost becomes impossible to define what the mod what it means to be modern. So the first problem is is what I'm calling the, the problem of describing modernity. And and the the problem is that when we describe modernity, are we describing a material or are we describing an attitude that we have which is which emerges from our access to the material. So to take the examples that we've seen so far, is modernity the ability to access books or the, the ability to access printing, the ability to read books, the, the ability to uh, print and, and to transfer and to communicate information via printed pages? Or is modernity the state of consciousness, the intellectual and emotional and cultural advantages that one gets by having access to these books and, and these printed materials. So, so this dichotomy of material and attitude. And to be clear, it's never a case of either or. It's always a case of both. But it's, it's always important that the, the relationship between these two descriptions of modernity is, is what makes it uh, an almost impossible concept to, to pin down. Now, the second problem is that of naming. And I've called it an adjective or noun problem. What I mean by that is that it's possible to define the modern simply as an adjective. Now, just to give some examples, think of phrases like the modern novel or the or modern cinema or modern Indian literature, for instance, or modern film or modern languages. So in all of these phrases, the word modern signifies a new variant of something which existed in a somewhat similar form, but maybe not as advanced or maybe not as accomplished a form as we have it now. So that this process of defining the modern as an adjective can be done by following a very simply chronological strategy. So for instance, we can define the modern British novel by describing what the modern, I'm sorry, what the Victorian novel was, and by saying, here are the things that the Victorian novel does in a different way. Here, for instance, here is how the Victorian novel describes character. Here is how the Victorian novel describes plot. And here is how the modern novel describes character and plot. Now, that is one way to define modernity. Now, another way of, of naming modernity, and, and this sort of replicates the problem of material or attitude, which is, is using mo the modern not as an adjective, but as a noun. So think of phrases like British modernity, or European modernity, or Indian modernity, or South Asian modernity or even even more more specific uh, i could say that this that that wearing these clothes or or wearing this this jacket and shirt is my way of being modern that, that someone else's way of being modern may be to wear indian wear to wear traditional wear such as a uh, kurta pajama so these are all examples where i am shifting the focus from the material to the attitude i'm i'm saying that we all know what it means to be modern and we all do it in different ways based on our cultural, our racial, our individual, our local linguistic belonging. So this is another problem. Now, and, and this is related to the third and fourth problems, which, which I will talk about, which, which are th the problem of locating a source or, or a location where modernity first emerges. And so if we all know what it means to be modern, su suppose I say what it means to be modern is to have a radically uh, open notion of individuality. Suppose, uh, suppose I define that, then would I be able to locate a place where that definition of the individual as being modern first emerged? And 
if suppose I identified Europe or North America as the location, then how do I place other iterations of that definition of, of modern? If people outside those locations embody the same attitude and, and appropriate that way of being modern, then are they somehow versions of that? Are they belated versions of that original modern? So there are all these value judgments and there are all these hierarchies that emerge, which which I don't think are very useful because we, we don't want to create these hierarchies of one original modern and, and other being others being versions of it. And similar to this problem of, of, of creating hierarchies unconsciously or, or consciously is the problem of dating the modern. So when did the modern emerge? And this will help me transition to the next uh, slide. And, and here I have created uh, or basically uh, borrowed one chronology uh, that, that helps us understand what modernism is. This is a chronology I've borrowed from uh, a book. Uh, this is Michael Levinson's book, A Genealogy of Modernism. And this is the kind of chronology of modernism that uh, used to be very popular and, and I think is still very popular in, in English departments and among scholars of, of English literature. Uh, primarily because this is an approach that equates modernism with the kind of work that was done by English language writers. And not only English language writers, but English language writers who were active in England in a certain period. And to be even more specific, it, it, it was actually a movement that was initiated and, and really powered through by uh, half a dozen individuals who, whose names have become, become clear. So for my, Michael Levinson, that movement in which a few authors, a few poets and, and writers decided that they would begin this movement and they would label themselves modern. And Ezra Pound is famous for making the slogan, make it new at, as the slogan of modernism. And this, the chronology that M Michael Levinson proposes, I, I think it's, it's very helpful. And so I think we should all take note of that begins in the year 1908. This is when Ezra Pound, the American poet arrives in London. Uh, the midpoint of this trajectory is when T.S. Eliot, another American poet, uh, arrives in England and shows Ezra Pound uh, his draft of the the, po the poem which will later become very famous, the, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And finally, the culmination of this trajectory occurs in the year 1922, uh, a major publication year in which three major works which define the literary movement of modernism were published. That is The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, Ulysses by James Joyce, and Yeats's later poems. So as you can see, uh, it is perfectly possible to undertake a study of modernism by limiting oneself to this period of almost uh, less than two decades. Uh, if one were to undertake this study, one would have to study what were the literary influences of these writers. And, and one would go back to at least Matthew Arnold, or if not Matthew Arnold, then at least to Thomas Hardy, uh, in the in whose work the the word modernism first makes its appearance, and and then one would also look ahead to the work of Virginia Woolf, uh, James Joyce, who's already mentioned here, but also others like E. M. Forster. Now, this is one way in which one one could study modernism. Uh, my job is to offer a multiplicity of ways, and so here is another timeline which which I have sourced from the work of Vinay Dharwadkar, who's a, another very, very, very powerful scholar. And this is a timeline that, that as you can see, looks familiar uh, because there is some overlap in, in terms of uh, this also beginning in the late 19th century, but it's actually radically different because this is a timeline that unfolds in a different location. So this is, modernism in India. And, and for Dharwadkar, there are very broadly four phases 
uh, and I'll move really quickly through through these phases. The first uh, begins in 1882 and, and goes on to 1916. Uh, and this is titled very generally Realism and Reform, bookmarked by the publication dates of uh, two important works, uh, Anand Martin 1882 by Bakim Chandra Chatterjee and Gauri Bhai Ray, or The Home and the World in 1914-15 by Ravindranath Tagore. Uh, the second phase, uh, as you can see, the worker borrows the year 1922, which is a kind of key and iconic number for scholars of English, being the year that The Wasteland was published. But here, for the worker, that date signifies less uh, the literary movement of British modernism and more the nationalist movement for independence in, in India. And, and this, this is the, the second phase is characterized by the, the beginning of the Satyagraha movement in 1920 and the culmination of independence in 1947. The, the key literary themes seen in this period are subaltern-centered realism, the critique of industrialization and migration from the city to the village. The third and fourth phases uh, deal with uh, post-independence India. They describe the dissatisfaction with the new Indian nation state and and find um, and the the last phase describes diaspora and cosmopolitanism. So the the reason I've tried to give these two timelines is to g give you a sense of how varied it can be or, or how impossibly difficult it can be to try and date modernism if one is taking modernism in as broad a sense as possible. And so I'll, I'll speak a little bit about why it's so complicated or, or why this, this happens to be the case. And in, in my understanding, the reason for this complication, it, it, it certainly appears unnecessary today but if one looks at the history of literary studies as it has evolved, then one can understand a little bit better what's going on here. So uh, I think the way that most people today understand literary modernism emerges from the work of scholars in the late 20th century. So I'm, I'm thinking of the work of scholars like Malcolm Bradbury uh, and, and, and so many others, Thomas McFarlane and, and, and so many others who first helped us understand what was the 20th century in terms of British literature and, and what were the innovations, where did they come from, what were the motivations and, and how we inherit those literary movements. But I think in the late 20th century and in the early 21st century, those studies or, or those histories of literature were complicated by a new kind of studies, which I think began with Edward Said's Orientalism, and, and we can call them very broadly post-colonial studies. But I think they're actually much more complicated because they involve a lot of area studies and a lot of historians from uh, or, or who worked on areas outside Europe and North America uh, began documenting accounts of how during the period that European historians and, and, and philosophers and, and scholars understood modernism or enlightenment to be unfolding in Europe, that same historical frame was the time during which empires were being challenged and dismantled by colonized people outside of Europe and North America. So uh, there, there came to be a lot of different kinds of studies of which, which, be, which became known as South Asian modernity or East Asian modernity or Caribbean modernity and so on. And, and there's a lot of different kinds of uh, books which are written under this frame. And to the point where it became almost unfair to, to use these adjectives in this way. It's, it, it seemed to unfairly privilege a certain European politics or, or a European place at the center of modernity and to look at all the others as somehow minor variants. When, when they were actually very powerfully challenging what Europe stood for. So, so right now, I, I think uh, there's a kind of unresolved uh, debate uh, among the scholars about whether one should speak of a singular modernity or multiple and, and alternate modernities. 
And the, the idea of a singular modernity, I think, is uh, favored most, uh, mostly by Marxist or, or left-leaning intellectuals. And this is because they, they find a way to view all of this, which is to say the, the history of the creation of European empires, as well as the challenges to those empires and the processes of decolonization within a Marxist teleology of dialectical materialism. So, I, I mean, to unpack that complicated phrase, I think one can think about the, the definition of imperialism given by Lenin, which is that it was imperialism is nothing but the final stage of capitalism. So, to think about that is to say that European empires emerge from a desire to create wealth and, and resources after it was clear that Europe itself or the land or the people or the resources of Europe itself could no longer satisfy the, the desire for economic expansion. And therefore, a handful of European traders went out and decided to colonize the, the rest of the world. And that process actually created the modern world as we know it. So it is possible to trace everything that we see today to that singular historical moment. And this is certainly what a lot of Marxist scholars would like to believe. And, and Frederick Jameson actually has a book titled A Singular Modernity. However, a lot of post-colonial scholars would disagree with that and, and would favor a more disparate approach to modernities. And, and that has led to the kind of scholarship on multiple or alternate modernities. And I I understand what, what may be the sympathies deriving this later approach. And it, it gives the sense that there is not one uh, overarching or one dominating definition of modernity, that, that different communities or people from different linguistic or cultural and educational backgrounds, racial backgrounds are free to devise their own relationship with what it means to be modern. And that is true to some extent. However, I, I believe that these, these freedoms or, or these uh, multiple un, and alternate modernities actually are a kind of uh, cosmetic choice, that, that it is an illusion of choice which actually hides a deeper lack of choice, which is that uh, we may choose how to be modern, but we do not choose whether or not we can be modern, right? So, so I, I certainly sympathize with that, but but I believe that it's important and it's uh, necessary to try and articulate a notion of a singular modernity. And to that extent, I, I want to offer a working definition of what modernity can be and, and what you can, and I'm here speaking specifically to students here who are preparing to read literary texts um, picked from a very British definition of, of what is modernism. Uh, here is a working definition that you can use to, to begin asking some interesting questions about these literary texts, about what their narrators are doing, about what their characters are doing, and, and to then come back and modify this definition. So this is a strictly a working definition. It is not, it is, it is meant to fail to explain everything that you find in, in modernist literature, but it is designed to help you get an interpretive start. So what is that definition? So uh, for a text to be called modern or for an author to be understood as engaging with modernity, I believe three things are important. The first is technology, uh, the second is consciousness, and the third is choice. So by technology, I mean uh, a lot of things, and, and this is a very, very non-exhaustive list. Uh, it could be automobiles, it could be telephones, it could be airplanes, it could be printing press, it could be cinema. Uh, but what is essential is that the, uh, the, the narrator or the author commit to describing how these technologies intrude or make a disturbing change or make a very destabilizing change into the kind of life, a biological, cultural, social life 
that the protagonists were living without these technologies. So technology intrudes on life and then people strategize, people try to cope with it, people try to live with these technologies, either improve their lives or just survive. So that is, is one aspect. The second is thanks to that intrusion of technology or thanks to that forced reckoning or thanks to that forced adjustment, a new consciousness is activated. A new consciousness through which individuals become aware of themselves as individuals in communities. They, they become aware of their place in a community, whether they are valued, whether they are not, whether they are recognized, whether they are not. So they basically start to ask difficult and critical questions about their relationship to the community. And finally, tradition. They, these individuals are forced to become aware and ask difficult questions about the tradition that they thought explained their lives. And But now, somehow, thanks to their new life or the way their life has changed due to these technologies, they are forced to ask how, how they relate to these traditions and whether these traditions truly value them or not, or, and whether they need to hold on to these traditions or look for new traditions. So basically another kind of destabilization, they, individuals are forced to ask difficult questions and, and re reconcile themselves to these two things, that is community and tradition. Finally, choice. Uh, this whole process, uh, being disturbed by technology, being forced to re-articulate one's relation to one's community, that are the individuals doing this of their own free will or are they or, or do they not have a choice at all in fact it is something that they are simply forced to do in order to survive right and and this this is different or this question will be answered differently for different individuals based on their identity based on their biology based on gender race and culture and and so that that is also a very important aspect of a modern text that to engage with that to, to be aware that the choice or its lack is not the same for everyone so with these three things i i believe one can one can um one can create a working definition of what modernity is or or, or how a text a, a literary text engages with the problem of modernity now before i end i want to help demonstrate this uh this tentative theory through the example of through a very quick reading of, of a literary text. And this is a text that um, this is titled uh, in, in Bengali, Nostanir, uh, English titled The Broken Nest, uh, published 1901 by Rabindranath Tagore. Uh, on the left side, you can see the cover of the Penguin uh, English translation published by Penguin Random House, Modern Classics, uh, translated by Arunav Sinha. Uh, you can also find a free uh, version and, and uh, of, of the story, the English translation on Arunavsa's website. So that's um, I thought that's a great uh, resource and it's it's really a gift because he's a great translator. So that's where you can find the the novella if you're interested to read it. And on the right side, uh, I've uh, simply placed uh, the cover of um, the DVD of, of Charulata, the film. Uh, from 1964 by Satyajit Ray, uh, based on the novella. And the difference in the title, the, the Broken Nest is the title of the novella by Tagore, and Charulata is the title of the film. That difference is actually key to to what I will say about the the story. And, and here I've actually selected uh, three scenes from the film just to help you visualize these characters. Uh, my comments are focused on the novella, not the film, but this will help me uh, move along fast as I give a brief synopsis. So the story is about uh, three people. Uh, first, Bhupati, played by Salin Mukherjee, who is this uh, very educated, um, uh, I think, um, fairly aristocratic uh, Bengali man who doesn't have to do any physical labor and therefore decides to start an English newspaper simply because he can. And it, it's as if some someone 
planted this fancy in his head and suggested to him and, and he thought why not let's let's do it and and so he could do that b because he could afford to so that's uh bhupati and then charu his wife the the second picture uh she is this very educated uh woman but who somehow uh is feeling a kind of emptiness in her life because her her life is empty because she has all her needs provided for and yet it seems that none of her actions have any consequence and and therefore she's uh she's kind of um empty and and the third is uh, amal who's a, a cousin of of bhupati who's who's invited to help with the newspaper and, and who's a of, of a college going age and who then uh, happens to spend a lot of time at home and, and and that's why I've chosen a scene where the two of them are together. And then Amal and Charu uh, develop a friendship, and which is when things get a little complicated. And I've called the section Desire Writing and Publication because the key emotional conflict in the story emerges from conflicting definitions of what writing does and, and how writing relates or, or connects an individual to the society around them. So Charu and Amal develop a friendship and through exchanging words. And, and initially it is through imagining a kind of fantasy island, fantasy garden. And then it graduates to Charu encouraging Amal to write things, to, to write little poems or, or little ditties, and then to share them only with her. So, so the two of them develop a relationship where Amal composes little poems and little stories and, and gives them to Charu to read. And this, this gives Charu a lot of satisfaction because she feels that this is the one sphere of her life in which her individuality has a consequence, that, that everything that Amal does, feels, thinks, writes, uh, speaks emerges from her emotional being and and so she's absolutely devastated when she finds out that one of the little uh, compositions that amal had created in in one of their games and, and shared with charu is actually accepted for publication and is published by a bengali literary magazine and so this is what this is how the narrative and this is from arnav sinha's english translation this is what Charu feels, and this is the first quote on the screen. Um, Charu tried to force herself to feel happy, but could not. She tried to understand why she felt so betrayed, but was unable to find any reason. Amal's writing belonged to her as much as to him. She could not clearly comprehend why she should feel so upset at the thought of other people reading those pieces and praising them. So this is, uh, I mean, we as, as modern readers can, can see what's going on. It's uh, it's a betrayal of the relationship that she had developed with him through exchanging their writing and and the publication, uh, which Amal thinks is a great thing because as a man he, he 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 cannot imagine a greater reward for his labor for his intellectual and emotional labor than the publication than the public dissemination, the, the public circulation in print of something that he had created in his mind, right? So this is um, a f fundamental difference between uh, the, the, the man and the woman there. And then a little bit later, uh, Amal uh, finds out that um, Amal actually forces Charu to, to write little things in response just to reciprocate his own labor at as it were. And uh, secretly, Amal submits one of Charu's writings to uh, a journal, which, which actually publishes it. And not only does the journal publish Charu's writing, but actually also attaches another highly um, praiseworthy comment, uh, praising Charu's writing and calling it to be much more superior to anything that was published earlier, including that by Amal. And when Amal suggests that that she should uh, submit her writing to to a journal and and uh, and allow outsiders, that is, public readers and editors of journals like her husband, who's also the editor of newspaper, 
to to read her work, Charu is absolutely horrified again. And and this is what she says when when Amal suggests that she read that she submit her work. Uh, this is the the second quote on the screen. Uh, Charu abandoned her pan, rising to her feet swiftly, attempting to retrieve her notebook by force. She said, "No, you mustn't read it to him. If you tell him about my writing, I won't write another word ever again." So again, the, the same logic applies here, which is to say that that for Charu, the, the publication of her composition is not a kind of academic or intellectual success, but rather the revelation or the exposure of her emotional self. And, and, and this is a theme in Tagore's work to, to critique the, the segregation or, or the isolation of women to the private realm of the uh, sort of uh, upper caste Hindu Bengali home. And later on in the story, uh, what happens is that, I mean, this is actually the beginning of the tragedy in the story. So after this, uh, when Charu's piece is published and attracts more praise than Amal's, Amal actually feels uh, somewhat slighted and, and, and starts avoiding her, uh, completely uh, aloof to the fact that that Charu is actually in, in love with him and and feels betrayed because uh, their writings were, were published. And the story ends with Amal leaving uh, the home and uh, Charu's husband also unable to identify the reason for this, this failure because uh, he also thinks that, um, that this was simply a, a kind of academic uh, discourse. And, and the tragedy is not that, um, or, or rather the, the title, The Broken Nest, refers to the, the fact that um, Charu's relationship with her husband, Bhupati, is uh, sort of de destroyed or, or no longer has any uh, emotional or, uh, or any intimacy. But, but there's a deeper tragedy, which is that not only does Charu not leave her husband or, or is forced to stay with this um, forced to stay in this very um, uh, disturbing and and uh, and in a relationship that doesn't provide any uh, satisfaction but but doesn't even uh, go go further or, or actualize anything with, with Amal and so uh, I think it's very important to note how the idea of printing and the idea of publication, as a means of public circulation of the intellectual labor of male subjects here in in the story causes this kind of violence in the private lives of of these of these three people and so in in this sense um, i hope i've been able to demonstrate how uh, we can consider a, a text like uh, the broken nest written very far from uh, modernist England also as a text that engages with these very problematic aspects of, of, of what we call uh, the modern. Uh, with that, I will I will stop and um, I will hand over uh, the proceedings to Lalit. Uh, Shaswat, you are you are not audible. Yes, I was going to say that you're muted. Okay, okay. Re really sorry about that. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, my, there's a bit of a problem at my end. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mahapatra for that richly insightful uh, talk. We'll come back to him with uh, questions and and comments after uh, Dr. Lalit Kumar makes uh, his presentation. So let me uh, uh, very quickly introduce. Uh, Dr. Kumar. Dr. Lalit Kumar is Assistant Professor of English at uh, Deen Dayal Upadhyaya College, University of Delhi. Uh, he has a PhD on uh, Methali uh, and Methali language in print culture, uh, I perhaps broadly called uh, literary cultures in, in North Bihar. Uh, he's also a translator, uh, somebody who's uh, 
taught and worked on uh, classical literatures, European and uh, Indian uh, classical literatures. He's also a, a columnist, a prolific writer who has uh, published in uh, Times of India, The Indian Express, Pioneer and Outlook. He, he did a uh, series on, on classical literature for, for Outlook. Uh, so uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Lalit Kumar to please begin with his talk. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Shaswat. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are audible, sir. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to share my thoughts on Lawrence, uh, thoughts on literary modernism. Uh, my presentation focuses on uh, the significance of travel for literary modernism with reference to Lawrence's writings on Mexico. Uh, modernist travel writings and novels uh, displaced the moralizing and didactic styles of Victorian travel writing by increasingly becoming subjective. It ended up becoming some kind of memoir, a sort of memoir in his, in his subjective overtone. Uh, some of the central features, some of the dominant characteristics of modernist writers include uh, exile or leaving home or rather self-exile, rootlessness, and expatriation. In fact, the opposition between the nomadic and sedentary life formed an underlying tension in the lives and writings of literary modernists. Uh, uh, getting away from the constraints of home is a common theme. For instance, Conrad travels to Malay archipelago or to Central Africa, Foster to Egypt and India, and Lawrence to Australia, Sri Lanka, and Mexico. So on the one hand, we see that writers want to escape home, get away from home, get away from the constraints of home. And on the other, we also see the quest for a cultural home. The quest for a cultural home emerges as an important motif in many writers. And the classic example is Henry James. Uh, the American expatriate writer uh, at home first in Europe and then settling in England as only there he believed could he save the Western cultural heritage from Americanization like that other expatriate American who made England his home and saw himself as the keeper of the classical European heritage. I'm talking about Eliot. So in Eliot and James both we can see uh, a quest for home, a cultural home. But Lawrence, unlike James and Eliot, travels first away from home, that is Nottinghamshire. Uh, by the way, currently uh, the, a test match is happening between India and England in Nottinghamshire. So uh, first we see in Lawrence a tendency to get away from home, from Nottinghamshire, then from England to Germany, to Switzerland and Italy, then out to Europe, to Australia, Sri Lanka, Mexico, before finally returning to England. Uh, in his travel writings, Lawrence describes places where the old ways of the traditional life are threatened by modernity. In a letter, in a letter, in a letter to E.M. Foster, he wrote, he complained, in fact, that England herself seems like a ship adrift, entirely without course or anchorage. Uh, Lawrence wanted a place that was that was Lawrence wanted a place that was less constricted, uh, less industrial, less civilized, less civilized. Uh, in fact, the area in Nottinghamshire in which he was brought up highlighted the contrast between natural and industrial worlds. The coal miner, while walking home from an industrial site often passed through relatively unspoiled countryside. For Lawrence, industrialization was a threat to a natural life. The industrial world is associated with mechanized feelings, with the death of spontaneous and in instinctive responses to life. So throughout his life, Lawrence had been looking for uh, a place away from the degenerated effects of modernity. 
away away from a place where the decadent aspects of modernity hasn't touched away from england away from europe particularly london in fact in his essay why i don't like living in london uh, lawrence writes is all dull is dull is all dull i'm quoting from the essay is dull is all dull this life here is one vast complex of dullness i am dull i am being dulled my spirit is being dulled my life is dulling down to london dullness so in fact travel became uh, a source a window to overcome this dullness and rootlessness for lawrence in the rest of my presentation i would like to answer two questions one what precisely drove the british novelist to become a ceaseless wanderer and explore mexico sri lanka and other parts of the world and two what makes contemporary readers especially indians especially indian readers empathize with his mexican experience his writings on mexico the three antidotes to dullness or boredom in the ancient world uh, wrote b h lawrence were sleep drink and travel he questions the ancient wisdom uh, in his attempts to overcome london dullness and proposes his own theory he writes from sleep you wake up from drink you become sober and from travel you become home you come home again you come home again and then where are you lawrence it seems wished for a permanent solution to boredom for he feels uh, more alien for he feels more alien in his hometown the midlands than anywhere anywhere else in the world he comes up in fact with two remedies in order to propel the monotony of a materialistic western civilization and industrial industrialized england and his remedies are love love and travel love and travel lawrence and his wife frieda spent most of their married life traveling during the first world war he got exemption from the military service due to his deteriorating health but he had to face the consequences of war since his wife frida was german they both were persecuted by stay at home patriots and driven from place to place he was contemplating to withdraw from the world to travel east and seek peace in buddhism in fact in several modernist writings we see uh, the trope of returning to east uh, be it in eliot w b yeats or in lawrence so lawrence also wanted to seek peace in buddhism his friend had gone to kandy sri lanka to study buddhism and pali at the buddhist monastery though lawrence didn't believe in buddhist inaction and meditation uh, the buddhist notion of peace fascinated him he eventually went to kandy to seek peace but found it too hot and enervating and left after spending a month there feeling disillusioned the restless lawrence captured his disenchantment with the east in a letter where he writes i don't like sri lanka at least i like looking at it but not to live in the east is not for me the sensuous spiritual voluptuousness the curious sensitiveness of the naked people their black bottomless hopeless eyes and the heads of elephants and buffaloes poking out of mud the queer noise of tall metallic palm trees all together the tropics have something of the world before the flood hot dark mud and the life inherent in it makes me feel rather sick so he feels soon as expected disillusioned disenchanted with the east and after being disillusioned with the buddhist conception of peace lawrence eventually reached mexico in september 1922 and two of his major writings uh, uh revolve around the theme of his mexican experience the novel the plumed serpent and the memoir mornings in mexico uh, i have titled the next section of my presentation the myth of quetzal cotl and sheshna quetzal cotl was the mexican god the biggest source of fascination and wonder for kate lesley kate lesley is the protagonist of 
the plume serpent and some critics have argued that she is the mouthpiece of lawrence so the biggest source of fascination and wonder for kate lesley uh, the protagonist of the plume serpent is the old aztec god called quetzalcoatl as we know mexico has been the home to some of the most ancient civilizations of the world including aztec aztec and maya so it's about the ancient aztec god called quetzalcoatl the god was precious to the aztecs before spain defeated them and conquered mexico in 1521 the mysterious name quetzalcoatl came from the name of a bird and a serpent quetzal is a bird that lived high up in the mists of tropical mountains it had beautiful feathers quetzal is the name of a serpent quetzal quetzal is the plumed serpent the local mexican god who had been forgotten by the mexicans ever since the coming of christianity two powerful mexicans in the novel uh, general cipriano and don ramon who is a judicious thinker and nationalist are planning to revive the old god in order to counter colonization don ramon describes the serpent before lesley the protagonist this is the description of the mythical god at the heart of this earth sleeps the great serpent in the midst of fire those that go down in the mines feel the heat and the sweat of him they feel him move it is the living fire of the earth for the earth is alive the snake of the world is huge and the rocks are his scales trees grow between them i tell you the earth you dig is alive as a snake that sleeps the earth as mexican legends say rests on a large snake moreover the earth is not dead but a living entity now while going through the above mentioned description of the earth and the serpent an indian reader if not informed about the context may easily read it not as an excerpt from the plume serpent but as one from the bhagavad puran a hindu mythological text in hinduism it is believed as uh, most of us know as we know all of us know it is believed that the earth which is alive rests on a huge snake called shishna uh, in the ramayan ram's younger brother lakshman is said to be an incarnation of shishna whereas in the mahabharat krishna's elder brother balram is an avatar of the celestial serpent according to the puranic beliefs the divine serpent carries the burden of the earth on his hood and where, whenever it moves its body an earthquake strikes the earth similarly the equivalent to the mexican bird uh, quetzal is the mythical bird garur which is worshiped as the vehicle of the hindu god vishnu incidentally due to its association with lord vishnu garur indonesia the national airline of indonesia borrowed borrowed its name from the sacred bird the ancient mexican god quetzal quetzal therefore is as captivating and a source of wonder for indian readers as it turns out to be for the irish lady kate lesley who like lawrence pays a visit to mexico in her meeting with don ramon another character a uh, nationalist in mexico lesley confesses that she loves the world quetzalcoatl ramon wants the gods of antiquity to come back and save the decadent and degenerated soul of mexico but lawrence didn't have a favorable opinion of aztec gods and goddesses they are he wrote in his travel narrative mornings in mexico unlovely and unlovable lot so we see a certain kind of ambivalence in lawrence's writings towards mexico unlike don ramon he finds no grace no charm no poetry in these gods he found a perpetual grudge in them one god grudges another gods grudge men whereas men grudge the animals he even calls the aztec god god gods and goddesses of love the goddess of dirt and prostitution snakes and eagles are also used in more than one way by several local tribes Lawrence describes various various rituals of the Hopi tribe in mornings in Mexico including the annual sacrifice of eagle and snake dance. Uh, he argues that the lives of American aborigines are innately and radically religious. Lawrence finds the religion of Indians and the surviving Aztec animalistic animistic sorry animistic. 
for him they are involved at every moment in their old struggling religion but if mexico breeds resentment to kit lesley lawrence's protagonist as well lawrence it also produce produces wonder if it is the land of violence it is also the land of mystery if the bleak mexican world generates pessimism it also evokes hope and hope and magic this ambivalence lies not only at the heart of this novel i mean the plume serpent but also at the heart of colonialism and racism for several mexicans the pursuit of a new cult is not only a religious endeavor but also a political project for don ramon the nationalist mexican nationalist is well aware of the increasing dangers of americanization americanization posed the threat to mexico and lawrence was aware of that he he foregrounds the threats of americanization the revival of old gods is an instance of cultural and religious nationalism that ramon subscribes to with a view to protecting the essence of mexico in fact in the novel uh, the increasing number of foreigners uh, and the dwindling population of mexicans has been foregrounded uh, the narrator says but the last census of mexico gave 17 million people and the census of the last year gave only 13 millions maybe the count was not quite right but you count 4 million people fewer in 20 years then in 60 years there will be no mexicans only foreigners who don't die lawrence in fact during his visit to the mexico city had found it rather ramshackle and americanized the apprehension regarding the cultural invasion of mexico by foreigners is portrayed in several hymns composed by don ramon in praise of the god could jal kotal americans staying in mexico have their own anxieties and apprehensions too which is a hallmark of an encounter between the colonizer and the colonized kate lesley is in a dilemma whether to stay or not to stay in mexico and the dilemma is of lawrence too as as lesley had heard that an old from an old american who had spent 40 years in mexico that a man without a strong moral backbone should not try to settle down in mexico if he does he will be broken into pieces both normally and physically and this tension in the encounter between the colonizer and the colonized uh, emerges as an important theme not only in lawrence but also in conrad em foster and several other writers and later on a uh, bhava theorized it the encounter between the colonizer and the colonized during his stay in mexico lawrence astutely observed what the mexicans thought of the white men and women he documents his observation in mornings in mexico and writes that to the mexicans a white man or woman is merely a sort of phenomenon something to watch laugh and wonder at for the locals the white man is a sort of extraordinary white monkey who has learned the semi magical secrets of the world and made himself boss of the show mexicans call these methods monkey tricks and monkey virtues their understanding of time distance and money lawrence found out was utterly different from those of the white people mexicans understood only three ways to measure time morning afternoon and night they found the westerners fondness for exactitude in time half past for instance half past 9 5 o'clock horrible similarly they measured the distance not in terms of miles for them a place was either near or far lawrence has put the ambivalence of mexicans towards the white men ironically in his uh, book mornings in mexico but the great white monkey has got hold of the keys of the world and the black eyed mexican has to serve the great white monkey in order to live he has to earn the tricks of the white monkey show time of the day coin of money machines that start at a second the strange monkey virtue of charity the white monkey's nosing round to help to save could any trick be more unnatural i have quoted from that book so lawrence has captured the seething anger of the locals who are upset at foreigners taking away their land 
oil and metal don ramon's hymns composed in the honor of aztec god therefore captures the indignation of mexicans especially their desire to drive away foreigners including their christian god to begin with in fact we see a genuine archaic and ritualistic force in lorenz's writings on mexico there is an emphasis on rituals ritualistic force old gods myths and, and and these themes appear not only in his mexican writings but also in rainbow i was told that uh, rainbow uh, uh, is a part of your curriculum in fact when we look at the opening the opening pages of the rainbow we see that lorenz describes life on the farm in mythic historical terms here we find a classic instance of the myth of origin in the form of the genealogy of Bran brangwens the family of brangwens and framed in a discourse which is a complex re, re deployment of the old testament genesis story of a pre industrial golden age when man was apparently at one with the natural world uh, at the outset of the novel we see uh, lorenz say lorenz right lorenz writing that they knew the intercourse between heaven and earth sunshine drawn into the breast and bowels the rain sucked up in the daytime so uh, and uh, and frank carmode in his writings on lorenz uh, he uh, he noticed lorenz's writing in Ra rainbow has a genuine archaic and ritualistic force which as i said is a feature uh, of not only in his uh, Uh, in his mexican writings but also other texts including the rainbow uh, so to conclude the racial profiling of mexicans myth of the serpent god stabilizing the earth and the apprehensions of americanization are some of the key issues in lorenz's writings on mexico which readers in india may find fascinating and empathize with the renewed crisis on the us mexican border over the construction of wall to regulate immigration makes it imperative to re revisit the plume serpent which deals with the tension between americans and mexican in the 1920s and what an irony when we look at the recent tension that has erupted between mexicans and americans what an irony on the one hand lorenz's hero don ramon was worried about the increasing threats of americanization of mexico in the 1920s and on the other recently trump administration which is at logger heads with the us congress which was at logger heads with the us congress over funding of wall along the mexican border appears to be worried about the Mexic mexicanization of america so on the one hand we had witnessed americanization of mexico the dangers of americanization of mexico in the 1920s in lorenz's writings and on the other now we see uh, the threats of uh, threats of mexicanization of america thank you so much i'll stop here thank you sir for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation uh, and uh, once again i would like to thank both the speakers for for your thought provoking remarks you have helped us think of literary and cultural histories of modernism in new ways methodologically your presentations have shown us ways of understanding um, literary history uh, beyond the usual uh, post colonial and orientalist uh, framework uh, as suggested by said decades ago uh, we need to therefore look at global modernisms if i may use that expression through through for the lack of better expression through let's say transnational and transcultural frameworks so we shall now take a, a few questions if that's uh, fine uh, yeah okay we lost one of our speakers possibly so uh, before we um, uh, take questions that our viewers have just a, a few questions uh, to dr mahapatra and this is on behalf of our students uh, could you please suggest a few uh, readings uh, for our students who would like to know more about the uh, let's say the uh, history of modernism a few readings that students will find useful yeah um i'll i'll be happy to send over a, 
a detailed and sort of extensive bibliography uh, after the the call. Uh, but I think some recent titles come to mind, and one that I can recommend immediately to students is uh, a, a book titled Modernism in a Global Context by Peter Collini. Uh, it's published th 2018 uh, by Bloom Bloomsbury Press, I think. Um, and so I like Peter Collini's work because uh, Collini actually relates modernism as it was practiced earlier in the in the 1980s and so on to to post-colonial studies as it is practiced today and uh, a lot of scholars see these two fields as somehow separate but but they are not and 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 that's what peter kalini does very well and and has been doing for a while and and this book is his recent and it's actually aimed at a student audience and, and not so much a, a, a research scholarly audience. So that that is a book that I will very strongly recommend. Uh, for, for more advanced uh, level work, I think Susan Friedman's work is, is, is excellent. And, and Susan Friedman was, I think, one of the first among uh, the English uh, literary sort of scholarly uh, group of uh, people who sort of exploded this idea of British modernism and, and made modernism almost impossible to, to locate or date uh, with, with any specificity. But uh, I actually don't recommend that so much to uh, undergraduates or only for students interested in, in doing uh, sort of uh, more specific research on the field. But, but, but yeah, uh, both uh, Friedman and Kalini are, are very strongly recommended, and, and and I'll be happy to send over a bibliography to to you, which which can be circulated among the students. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, we have a question here. It's not in the uh, YouTube message box. I have received it over message, uh, and this question is uh, for uh, Dr. Dalit Kumar. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, Sri Lanka in your presentation. Uh, could you uh, talk a bit more about uh, modernist writers and, and their connection with uh, Sri Lanka? Leonard Wolf also has written about Sri Lanka. So, uh, Lalit sir, could you please uh, talk a little bit about uh, modernist writers and their uh, fascination with Sri Lanka? Yes, Shastra. Uh, in fact, uh, Bloomsbury has published the novel that you just talked about, uh, 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 Shaswat. And in fact, last night we were having a conversation. What a coincidence, uh, Shaswat. We were having a we were having a conversation about Leonard Wolf's uh, no Sri Lankan novel. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a novel. This novel is titled "The Village in the Jungle." So uh, I'll, I'll recommend this recommend this book for uh, exploring uh, Ulf's connection uh, with Sri Lanka. Uh, in fact, several other authors also uh, paid a visit, including Lawrence's friend, had paid a visit visit to Sri Lanka to explore uh, Buddhism. But uh, many of them got disillusioned also, and then uh, they returned, like Lawrence. Uh, but of course, Leonard Ulf's book is a fascinating source. Uh, to explore uh, the connection of modernist writers with Sri Lankan, uh, Sri Lankan experience, especially Buddhism. Yes, uh, uh, Thank you, sir, for your response. Uh, I, I mean, this is not really a question. This is just an observation, and this is for Dr. Aruni Mahapatra. Uh, you began, of course, with a very uh, important uh, anecdote from uh, Fakir Mohan Senapati's uh, autobiography, and then you spoke about uh, the choice or the lack uh, thereof, as you uh, rightly said. Uh, and we see this in other uh, autobiographies as well, where uh, the writer uh, talks about his uh, say, preoccupation or his intimate links with print. And, and I was just uh, 
I mean, this is just thinking aloud. I was also thinking of Gandhi. Uh, in his autobiography, he has a lot to say about uh, the printing press. For example, when he talks about uh, Indian opinion, he says, week after week after week, I poured my soul into its columns and the difficulty of uh, running the press, the expenses uh, that uh, he has to incur, the losses that he has to suffer. So, so we often see this uh, preoccupation of uh, preoccupation with technology, and that's uh, and what I really thought was very important there, and something uh, which needs uh, more thinking on our part um, is this preoccupation with technology and how that, in fact, is an indicator, one of the important indicators of writers trying to engage with uh, with modernity. How they try to when they try to define themselves, because when we talk about, in case of autobiography, for example, uh, it has now become commonplace to suggest that. Uh, we, you didn't, we didn't have a tradition of writing autobiographies in, in South Asia and it was new reticence, etc., etc. But, but part of the way in which that is expressed or you get a glimpse of uh, that, that struggle of writing something like an autobiography is also the way in which these writers have to deal with or have to uh, confront uh, 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 technology. So would you mind uh, uh, sharing your thoughts on, on, on this particular point? Yeah, uh, thank you for that very thoughtful response, uh, Sashwa. You, you've actually identified a key uh, theme there. And to to the list of uh, illustrious um, South Asian or, or Indian fi figures struggling with, with printing presses, I would also add Prem Chand, uh, who in his uh, autobiography has a very powerful and I think very moving account of the debt that he was running into just uh, to to keep the press uh, going and and so yeah you're right this is a very poignant uh, and uh, repetitive sort of pattern and the preoccupation with with technology i uh, as i'm using the word technology i'm actually beginning to wonder if that's the right word to use uh, and and because the word Technology seems to privilege the the instrument uh, so much, and and I, I don't know if the instrument itself deserves so much attention here, but rather it's the it, it's the attitude, it, it's the desire of of the individual more than the instrument, and the the instrument in in, in that case is actually really uh, doesn't matter at all, I think, and. Which is to say that the individual desire to circulate the writings would would latch on to any available instrument, and so the printing press uh, doesn't have any unique value as an instrument. I think it happens to be useful in these contexts because, of course, of the of, of the history of technology and, and so on in the late nineteenth century, the the printing press, uh, but. Um, Yeah, uh, I I agree with, with with what you were saying, and and I think this this reveals uh, and and just to broaden the idea of technology, not so much to focus on the instrument, but rather an an approach to to the self. And I think this is uh, an argument that's been made by several scholars of the autobiography and. Um, which I think you also referred to in your response about the, the scholarship on autobiography. And I, I can't remember exactly, but I, I remember reading a, a description of autobiography itself as a, as a technology of the self. And I think some of this goes back to the work of Michel Foucault, but, but I think uh, several scholars of autobiography in non-European and, and South Asian contexts uh, will also agree that that a modern approach to the self can can also qualify as a technology and 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 not so that, that we don't need to focus on the instrument of the printing press as a technology alone that that a modern sensibility uh, which inspires people to talk about their lives and to disseminate their lives using whatever instrument available to them, which may happen to be the printing press, that sensibility itself qualifies as enough of a technology. Um, I don't know how much of this is uh, useful, but um, that's that's what I think. 
uh, thank you. We have uh, one question from from one of our former students, uh, which is: Is modernity perceived through an individual's own instinct, or is it shaped by the milieu in uh, of which he or she uh, is a part? Hmm. Um, I think I can say something about that, uh, unless anyone else wants to say. So, so I I don't think it's an either or uh, ever, and I don't think we can think about the individual as an isolated figure, completely separate from the the milieu ever, and. The way that I have always understood modernity is always the relationship. It, it's always a new consciousness of the relation between individuals and society. So, 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 so the shortest answer is to say that neither in the individual or the milieu can shape anything close to the modern or or what we call modernity by themselves it is always so i, I think what i'm pushing for or, or what i'm calling on to be recognized as modern is the relationship that the two are always implicated in that that it's impossible to talk about the, the individual uh, without naming certain identities without naming religion or gender or, or nationality and it is these ways of naming the individual which i would call modern so so yeah that's that's my answer yeah i would like to add something to what arni has already said uh, i agree it's not a question of either or and in fact when we talk about modernity as a historical movement as a cultural movement we go back to 18th century europe and there i am reminded of swift because swift was uh, an author one such author who despite writing in the 18th century ended up challenging several tenets of modernity several tenets of the enlightenment for instance if rationality was a fundamental component fundamental constituent of modernity emphasis on rationality emphasis on science and reason were the dominant motives in uh, writings 18th century writings swift ended up questioning the entire narrative by writing against the grain he questions the fundamental tenets of christianity uh, uh, for instance in a letter to alexander pope he said that the objective behind writing a text like gulliver's travels for me was to prove the falsity of the definition that man is a rational creature rather i wanted to prove that man is rationus capax that is man has the ability ability to act rationally occasionally man is not a rational creature so the very fundamental premise of modernity was turned upside down by swift so as a writer either you may embrace the dominant grain of the age or you may turn it upside down and swift ended up turning the fabric of modernity down he tore it down he turned it upside down so it cuts both ways uh thank you so much for your response sir uh, uh i would once again like to thank our speakers for for sparing time for us for their extremely uh, uh valuable uh, inputs for their insights uh, i'm thankful to our audience who joined us today uh, despite the fact that it was scheduled a little early in the in the day and for patiently listening uh, to us and for their questions um thank you everybody once again for for joining us today we'll be uh, we'll be back soon with uh, more of these uh, webinars and and uh, online lectures in in near future uh, thank you so much thank you so much thank you sachin and thank you everyone